Okay, so once again, a very good morning, warm welcome to our second international edition of the MPAX Wildlife Management webinar series. Thank you for joining us all on Zoom. My name is Serena. This morning, I'll be your host together with Dr. John Shah, who is my colleague from the Wildlife Management Division here in MPAX. But raising awareness and understanding of wildlife is key to allow communities like here in Singapore to safely share spaces with wildlife and enjoy the benefits of living close to nature. So in this international edition, we are seeking out international subject matter experts to better understand how other countries manage human wildlife encounters. So for today's Q&A session, we have already received all your pre-submitted questions that you have sent in. Uh, we will be answering them right after the presentation. But without further ado, I'm going to hand the time over to Dr. John Shah, who will be sharing a little bit more about our speaker today. John, please. Hello. Thank you, Serena. And a very good morning to everyone who's tuning in today. So for today's webinar, we have invited Dr. Hit Hiroto Inari, who is currently professor for the Faculty of Agriculture at Yamagata University, Japan. So Prof Inari received a Doctor of Agriculture from Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology in 2007. Prior to working at Yamagata University, he was a postdoctoral fellow of Primary Research Institute, Kyoto University on 2007-2009, and an assistant professor at Usunomiya University in 2010-2013. So Prof Inari is also the chairperson of the Exploratory Committee on Macaque Conservation and Management, which is set up by the Member Society of Japan. So the topic that Prof Inari is going to share with us today is on wildlife management in Japan in the context of recent population recoveries of large mammals, such as the Japanese macaque, the sika deer, the wild boar, and the black bear. So this has intensified conflict between people and wild mammals and conflict has been exacerbated by drastic changes in the interrelationships between the Japanese people, forests, and wildlife, as well as the unprecedented nationwide human depopulation. So Prof Inari thinks that although damage management techniques have been used to mitigate wildlife conflict issues, a solution is needed to the physical and psychological hollowing out of communities in a new era of shrinking communities across Japan. So today, let's hear what Prof Inari has to share with us today. After his presentation, we will be having a Q&A session. So we have already received your submitted questions, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can during this Q&A. So now I will hand over to Prof Inari, please. Uh, Inari-san, you can start whenever you are ready. Thank you. So thank you for introducing me, John. So good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I appreciate organizer to invite me this valuable opportunity to share my study with the international audience. And thank you all for making the effort to attend this webinar. So my name is Hiroto Enari, I'm a professor of Yamagata University. So now I share my slide, so just a moment. Okay, can you see my slide? Okay. Yes, uh, Inari-san, we can see your slides. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, before I begin my presentation, let me briefly introduce myself. So my academic specialty is the discipline of mammal ecology and management. Uh, especially, I have studied about social ecology of Japanese macaque for more than 20 years. This macaque is an endemic primate species in Japan, and the only primate species is living in heavy snow areas where the snow cover exceeds more than two meters in depth. So I have a special interest in how primate species overwinter under the extremely severe condition. If I have another opportunity, I'd like to introduce such topic in the future. I will introduce the detail later, but this macaque has met ironic fate through human activities and now has generated severe conflict with people. 
So in these days, I'm studying about the population and habitat management of rural macaques. And I'm participating in the policy making of macaque conservation and management with the Japanese government. As is the case with macaques, in the past decades, I have also studied about the conflict with the Sika deer. Uh, this deer is natural, naturally distributed in the eastern part of Asia and the far east of Russia. Population, population of deer in Japan once decreased in the early 20th century, but their population are rapidly increasing in recent years, and uh, this Sika deer have generated the various conflict is people like macaques. Okay, now moving on to today's topic. Today, I would like to talk about the such human wildlife conflict. First, I will introduce a brief overview of mammal issues in the modern Japan. Second, I will explain the key causes of those wildlife issues. I consider there are two dominant causes of those issues. The one is a historical change in the relationship between mammals and people. And this change could result in the decrease in the various positive services caused by mammals. The second cause is a drastic social change of Japan caused by rapid human depopulation. Human, human depopulation because of the Following the birth rate and the aging population has been also observed in several countries, especially in Europe. But, uh, but the highest population decreasing rate is now observed in Japan. I consider that the social change caused by depopulation highly influenced the current human wildlife conflict. Based on this topic, here, I will discuss the need for reconstructing the discipline of wildlife management. As you may know, the discipline of wildlife management originated with game management in Europe or North America. This means traditional wildlife management was constructed under the society with the population growth. But now, we have to readjust the wildlife management appropriate for the new age of human depopulation society. In Japan, we have successfully de developed a lot of efficient wildlife management techniques to decrease the damage by mammals. But unfortunately, the wildlife issue in Japan remains unresolved. For this, I consider that we cannot resolve the current wildlife issue without reconstructing the design of human communities. So today, I will step, uh, I will step a bit deeper into the human dimensions or uh, social science of wildlife management. So, I will move on the topic regarding the background of wildlife issue in Japan. So this map shows the historical change in the distribution of uh, sika deer, white boar, and mac uh, macaques, and brown and black bears. Uh, brown bear lives in the Hokkaido region. Hokkaido region is here. And the black bear is living in the other part of Japan, is here. These four figure mammals are typical species causing a conflict with local people. In common, the population of these four mammals largely decreased in the middle of the 19th century because of large-scale loss of forest and excessive game hunting. But after the middle of the 20th century, the conservation effort by Japan's government to protect the declining mammal population resulted in the gradual recovery of those populations. These maps were made by government, so the legend of the past distrib distribution is a map uh, painted with different colors, sorry for that, but the latest distribution of those are commonly painted with red colors. Can you see the red grid in the map? So as shown in the red colored grid, their population recovery have continued until now. 
Ironically, however, these recent population recovery have rarely been considered as conservation success by most Japanese, also including the Japanese government. Instead, these recovery have received negative reception from most people because residents in rural Japan face serious risks from their invasion into the human habitat. Actually, the population recovery of this mammal has resulted in reducing the physical distance between mammals and the people. As a result, when they break into the farmland, severe crop losses has occurred. As for deer, black bear, and the brown bear, they frequently feed on the bark of trees like this pig, uh, like this pig here, uh, this, like this photo. So when they enter into the freshly areas, the commercial value of the, those planted trees are lost. This line graph shows the temporal change in the agricultural damage by the four mammals. Vertical axis shows the total damage amount in Japan, and the horizontal axis shows the years. As will be introduced later, in Japan, we have developed we have developed a lot of efficient techniques for reducing agricultural damage, but unfortunately, the damage amount has been stuck at high level. The damage by mammal is not just agriculture. When middle-sized mammals, such as the mask part of the shibet and the raccoons, which are the non-native species in Japan, but those species expand, expand their distribution. Then they often enter into the roof space of the houses and excrete of feces and urine there, like this photo. These mammals are typical infection vectors. In addition, the ticks, ticks is like this. Uh, the ticks have now rapidly increased their abundance with an expansion with an expansion of large mammal distribution, because large mammals often cross to ticks. So tick transmitted infection is now emerging the severe social issues in Japan. Furthermore, when large mammals, especially deer or Japanese silo and the wild boar entry into the human living space, they cause a traffic accident called load kill, like this part. And black bear and the brown bears sometimes cause accident resulting in the injury or death of a people. That's a very sad accident. And that, that happened especially in the year when the natural fruit productivity is poor. In this way, the mammal caused various ecological disservices. I summarize such negative services in the upper side of this figure. And those disservices become more frequently exposed with the progress of mammal population recoveries. Here, we should also focus on the ecological services or positive services originating from mammals. I also summarize such positive services in the lower side of this figure. In fact, another cause for expanding, uh, exposing negative services is the decline in the positive services. Now, I will introduce the detail of the current situation of those positive services. As a prime example, the resources value of mammals sharply decreasing the modern Japan. Before early 20th centuries, the hunting of barbarous mammals, including even primates, were observed throughout Japan. But now, the hunting for recreation, whereas hunting for commercial uses, is not popular in Japan, especially among young people. As for macaques, hunting of them is now strictly, strictly prohibited. In this context, Japanese government has now launched a policy to improve the resource value of mammals. For this, the government has provided official money to build their deer and the boar meat processing facilities. Consequently, 
the number of facilitated has increased 15 fold in the last 10 years. Now we have about 600 game meat process facility throughout Japan. However, game meat is not popular among post most Japanese people. So more than 90% of hunted games have still been discarded as waste. The amount of game meat discarded as waste is approximately 2,000 tons per year. And the disposal cost of waste meat is estimated reach into 1 million US dollars per year. The same for the, for the fur industry. Fur industry in Japan was a stable one until early 20th centuries. For example, fur of hair is a kind of rabbit. Uh, the, the fur of hair was one of the popular public to export, especially to Europe. So more than 1 million of hairs was hunted per year. As, as a result, the fur of hair made profit of more than 22 million US dollars per year. However, as you know, the international market price of fur or mammals have rapidly stagnated since 1980s. So all the fur industry in Japan closed down until 2016. Not only resource values, but also spiritual values of mammals have a lobby tree decrease. This is because the modern Japanese have lost the worship of nature and the spirit called animism. Animism in Japan was shaped by the traditional view of nature called Shinrabansho. Shinrabansho is like this, <laughs> this is a Japanese character. Yeah, but the Shinabansha means that God exists in all things in nature. For example, wild boar are uh, worshipped as a messenger of a God called Marishten. Marishten is the God of War. And the Japanese macaque are also worshipped as a guardian God of domestic livestock. So all Japanese people, especially in Northern Japan, often set the skull of macaque in the fourth breeding stable. But most of modern Japan people, especially young people, do not have such religious mind. As you know, most mammals have a species-specific law to sustain local biodiversity. But unfortunately, we have failed to fully understand their positive services. When talking about a friend talking macaque as an example, we know their supporting services or regulating service only through their seed dispersal functions. This is because there, there are a lot of science evidences only for their seed dispersal function. Except, except the seed dispersal function, we just know the very limited information regarding their services. <laughs> this means that nobody can sufficiently answer the very simple question why we must not exterminate the mammal population, although they cause various severe damage against people. In this manner, the eco ecological positive services become more invisible. In contrast, the ecological disservices or negative services become more and more obvious among most people. As a result, social or cultural killing capacity of the most mammals, sometimes called wildlife acceptance capacity, had rapidly decreased in the modern Japan. Then most people in Japan have recognized most mammals as just pests. And the current efforts of wild management in Japan are becoming just pest management. So, most people always think about think about only one thing, that is how the abundance of best mammal can be regulated. To respond to this public opinion, in 2013, 
the Japanese government developed a drastic wild management plan to help the number of deer, boar, and macaque trips by massively culling until 2023, that is the next year. This line chart shows the number of animals killed by hunting or culling. The number of deer and boar killed, killed per year have attained 600,000 in recent years. So here I show the estimated total number of those mammals by Japan's government. So this means that we killed 30% of the estimated total population of deer, 70% of the total boar population, and 15% of the total macaque population every year. Sorry. I, as, as I mentioned until now, I explore the causes of the modern day wildlife issue from the temporal change in the ecosystem services. From now, I'd like to move on to another causes of the wildlife issue in Japan. I consider that the second cause is a drastic social change caused by a rapid human depopulation. First, I'd like to provide a brief introduction of human depopulation dynamics observed in Japan. This line plot shows the temporal change in the human population of Japan. The year of 2008 is a turning point. Uh, it's a turning point moving from population increase phase to decreasing phase. Human depopulation is directly linked to the decline of social infrastructures, such as school, hospital, transportation, and also the deterioration is uh, various administrative services, such as social welfare. So most people in rural Japan have turned to emigrate to capital region, such as Tokyo. In contrast to further population concentration in the mega city such as Tokyo, human settlement in rural Japan have been vanishing. There is a shocking future forecast provided by Japan's government. Green colored grid in this map shows the expected areas where all residents will disappear until 2050. People will be observed only in some mega city in the near future. The most part of Japan will be filled with forests or wildlife habitats. Now, when symbolic world become common in the present Japan, that is Shinrin-hora. Shinrin-hora means the saturation of forest. Even at this moment, the amount of the forested area attained nearly 70% of, of the national land. This percentage is the highest in all of, all of the Japan's history. So this percentage is expected to further increase in the future. From now, I will talk about the influence of human depopulation or shrinking communities on the, current, on the current wildlife issues. First phase of the shrinking community is pretty simple. That is decreasing in the human activities caused by human depopulation. Obviously, this phase became the immediate target that leads the most large mammals to easily access human living areas. But fortunately in Japan, we have already developed the body's efficient and labor saving techniques to prevent such mammals from entering human communities. For example, we have already developed efficient animal proof fences. This photo shows the electrified fence for macaque, mac or boar, and for deer, and uh, for other middle sized mammals. 
This photo shows the countermeasure techniques against the black stripping of conifer plantation by second deer and black bears. So the past repeated experiment demonstrates that ex excellent effectiveness of these techniques. So we have already responded to the wildlife issue caused by the first phase of shrinking communities. However, the second phase of shrinking community makes it difficult to use the current effective countermeasure techniques. In this phase, the abandoned farmland and vacant dwellings rapidly tree increase. Those abandoned, those abandoned land use can offer the safer habitat of most mammals, even in the settlement, and result in the reducing landscape of fear. For example, Vacant houses become breeding sites of wild birds and various middle-sized mammals. In some cases, those vacant houses offer comfortable refuges for macaques during the severe winters. The mean rate of the vacant dwelling is about 70% of all dwelling in the current Japan, and this value is expected to reach about 30% within the next decade. With the progress of the land use abandonment, the function of the social community became weakened. Then it became difficult for most communities to sustain public activity and mutual assistance among all the residents. In this phase, only residents having enough motivation to conduct the countermeasure have no other choice but to individually take stopgap measures with lower cost effectiveness. For example, the Japanese government has encouraged the resident to set up the efficient design of fencing by surrounding the, the uh, by surrounding the full of the community, like this figure. But the fact is, only resident with motivation build their fence by surrounding each farmland. Of course, this fencing design is not cost effective and require the higher maintenance cost. In addition, reminding residents without sufficient motivation to individually conduct a countermeasure just depend on the population regulation as a typical countermeasure by local administrations. As a result, in recent Japan, we can see lots of huge traps called the coral traps Throughout Japan, this photo shows the coral trap for Japanese macaques. So those traps are legally used in the various community as a public works. When reaching the final phase of the shrinking communities, most residents lose their pride and affection for the communities. And the result, uh, and the residents finally reduce their willingness to remain in the community. Declining the resident ability, uh, declining the resident ability to think about the future of the community often become difficult to identify the common goal for problem solving regarding the current wildlife of issues. So, in the first phase of the shrinking community the goal of wildlife management become more obscured. This figure shows the summary that I have mentioned until now. So the first phase of the shrinking community are closely connected and the negative spiral linking to forward out community is created. The cause uh, the, codes is, uh, the case in the modern Japan clearly, clearly shows the wildlife issue cannot be solved just by supporting damage management techniques. Then, a strong driving force to reverse the negative spiral is required. Without it, without it, we cannot set a definite and meaningful goal of wildlife management. Most effort to create the uh, most effort to create their community design in the past focus on 
how we can stop the decline of the human population. But now we notice that we should restructure the community design appropriate for the new era based on the understanding that we cannot avoid the depopulation in the future. In fact, the Japan's government has now launched an effort to readjust the present society and the economy applied to the depopulation society. One of the government-led initiatives is the reorganization of natural land use by downsizing human community and promoting networking among remaining a remaining community in order to share the limited key social infrastructures and the resources. Based on the attempt to the organization of the land use, the various community have now started to embark on the unique effort to restore, to restore the resident pride and affection for their community by reactivating, reactivating the traditional culture called the Satoyama. So I'm now approaching the end of my presentation. So today I explore the cause of the modern day wildlife issue in Japan from two aspects. The one is temporal change ecosystem services and the other is social change caused by human depopulation. To resolve them in the past, we only focus on how we could reduce these services caused by the recovering mammal populations. Now, there have already been lots of efficient techniques to reduce such negative services, including non lethal countermeasures. But most public in recent Japan tend to strongly depend on not non lethal countermeasures, but lethal countermeasures, and as a result, excessively regulated mammal population, uh, excessively regulated mammal population. So to, to break away from this situation, we first should explore the positive services derived from mammals, not only enhancing the resource value, but also spiritual value of mammals. And then we should reconstruct the community design to restore the resident pride and affection for the community and the shrinking society. I consider this effort also contribute to exploring the positive services of mammals. The history of wildlife management is not so long in Japan. So we have just imitated the effort of wildlife management learned from Europe and North America in the past. But now we first enter into the new era of shrinking society and we noticed that limitation of the existing knowledge and techniques of wild management. There, therefore, we have to readjust the discipline of wild management appropriate for the new age of the shrinking society. Without this effort, we, we will lose the role of wild management as a tool to design the sustainable communities. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. So I have written some academic paper to know more about the knowledge and technique of wealth management and the shrinking society. If you are interested in the today topic, please look over these papers. Thank you for your attention. Hello. Thank you, Professor Inari, for sharing about what's happening in Japan. So we will now proceed to our Q&A session. Thank you to everyone in the audience who submitted questions, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can during this Q&A. OK, let's proceed with the Q&A. Inari-san, you OK? Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. OK, so the first question related to wildlife management. Are there differences in management techniques when dealing with animals? that may be considered more dangerous, like bears, as compared to deer? And is management priority based more on the danger animals pose, wildlife damage caused, or on the intensity of public complaints? Okay, thank you for the good question. 
So uh, as you may suspect, most residents are more sensitive to the accident directly causing the injury or death of people rather than agricultural damage. So black bears and brown bears are typical mammals causing such damage. In short, the Department of Local Administration deal dealing with such accident and agriculture damage are different. So consequently, the management policy is also different among the types of damage by mammals. So actually, at this moment, the population density of black bear or brown bear is much lower than deer or white bear. So the frequency of such accident causing injury or, death, injury or death of people is much lower. So the management policy dealing with such accident is not sufficiently developed. So at this moment, the most wide management policy has been focused only on the agriculture damage by deer, bull, and metrics. Does this answer you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So there are people who are killed every year by bears, black bears and brown bears, right? So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, next question, please. Yeah. So next question, wildlife conflict issues are mainly concentrated in rural areas. Is there evidence of wildlife population expansion to urban areas? And if so, are there different approaches to dealing with these problems? Yes. Uh... Uh, there are a lot of evidences that most large mammals have been further expanding their distribution to urban areas where high human population density is observed. And those mammals result in the physical damage such as causing injury or traffic accident. And also they cause a psychological damage against urban residents because most people feel scared by large mammals entering into daily living space, such as the garden and the houses. So one of the most difficult points to deal with such urban wildlife issue is that we have only limited measures to respond to such urban wildlife. In fact, we have developed countermeasure techniques against the expanding mammal by using fencing techniques. But of course, we cannot use the fencing techniques in in urban areas. So, and in addition, we in Japan have the strict regulation of the guns, especially in urban areas. Basically, we cannot use the hunting guns even if the dangerous animal, such as black bears, brown bears, enter into the human dwellings land because of Japanese laws. So, we have now been in the process of reviewing the urban wildlife management policy to preliminarily regulate the spatial distribution of those expanded mammals. In sum, to respond to the urban wildlife issue, we have now focused on not the regulation of the abundance or population density of mammals, but the strict regulation of the mammal distribution expanding to the urban area for the precautionary actions. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, next question. Yeah. So is there a reason why there is a peak in total agricultural damage caused by wildlife between 2011 and 2013? Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, at this point, I think that's, there's no valid evidence to explain those peaks in the total agriculture damage. Perhaps, perhaps the large scale natural disaster might partially explain this. So maybe, as you know, huge earthquake mm. ha happened in 2011 in, in South Japan. Mm. So local government were compelled to engage in the earthquake reconstruction and say they, so the government could not afford to maintain the political and the financial support throughout the wildlife issue around the time. But I'm not sure about this point. Oh, yeah, it's about possible. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, next question. 
Okay, so uh, Inari San, I'm going to ask you the next set of questions that yes. focus mainly on uh, public views as well as perceptions of wildlife management in Japan. So the question is, are uh, wildlife management options constrained by animal welfare groups in Japan? For example, uh, you mentioned that fur industries in Japan were closed in 2016. Is this a result of public pressure uh, because of animal welfare? And related to this is the management plan to massively cull like uh, deer, boars, and maquettes. Um, are the Japanese public supportive for such measures? Oh, thank you for the question. So first, I have to explain that the fur industry in Japan was a typical export-oriented industry, especially toward the European countries. So. Just because of the reduction of the international market price of mammals fur, especially in Europe, all the fur industry of Japan closed in 2016. And uh, as you may suspect, we in Japan have some animal welfare groups and those groups have a voice and a complaint to the current government policy that strongly focus on the strict, strict population regulations. But basically, the consciousness of the general public in Japan toward animal welfare has not been always high compared with such as uh, European countries. And most, pro uh, most public, including other people, does not always deny the current government policy leading to the massive culling of mammals. However, uh, however, we must keep in mind here that this situation does not mean that most people in Japan positively support the government policy. This situation just means that the non-stakeholders, such as most of urban people, do not have a lot of interest in wildlife management. So I consider this situation is the real problem in Japan's wildlife management, I think. Thank you so much, Inari-san, for taking those questions. Yeah. Uh, the next question, or rather like questions, group of questions is also related to public perception. So it says here, wildlife acceptance capacity is rapidly decreasing. Are there demographic trends to cultural acceptance of wildlife damage? People moving to the cities are usually younger people, and those who remain behind in rural areas are usually older. So does this mean that the spiritual values are also diminishing uh, amongst the older generation? And are there any targeted outreach programs to address this? Oh, thank you for the comment. So the past study have shown that wildlife acceptance capacity of people is strongly sensitive to the strengths of the connectivity of with mammals based on their past experiences. And such connectivity is generally created when people receive the various ecological positive services from mammals. As shown in my presentation, we in Japan once exterminated, ex exterminated various, local po uh, various local population mammals by deforestation and excessive hunting by the early 20th century. And the recovery of the mammal population has been observed only in now, only in the, these recent years. So not only younger people, but also older people do not have a sufficient opportunity to create such positive connectivity or a good relationship with mammals. So for this reason, I do not consider there, there is a large difference in the wildlife access capacity between younger people and older people. So we need to address the difficult task to recover the positive relationship with mammal among all the people, regardless of the, their age. So as mentioned before, the Japan's government has launched to promote the use of game meat to improve the positive sides of mammals. But at this moment, we cannot say that this effort works well. So we need more innovative activity for this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
Next question is related to abandoned land use. So regarding the hollowing out of communities, were there any consideration to consolidate some communities and let nature retake what was abandoned? And what are possible land use plans for this abandoned land? Okay, thank you. So the uh, present at uh, the present basic policy of Japan's government against the depopulation society is downsizing the human living areas by consolidating the infrastructures of remaining community and the major of the municipalities. So as you may suspect, the abandoned land has continued to increase in the modern Japan. In this situation, some researchers, also including me, have now started discussion concerning the reusing those abandoned land. For example, uh, ec ec ecological reviving is considered as one of the effect measures. As you may know, the ecological reviving is a novel concept originated in the Europe to, to create a self-sustainable nature system without any human interventions in abandoned land. But so we in Japan have faced the difficult task of reusing such abandoned land because we in Japan have strict legislation regarding the land ownership. In general, in general, such abandoned land are private land, so if local government cannot easily involve in the reorganizing the present land use. So we have now been in the process of reviewing the policy to improve the feasibility of reusing the abandoned land, including ecological reviving. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Inari-san. I think yeah. we have uh, one more question. So we understand that the consumption of uh, game meat such as deer and boar is allowed in Japan. So uh, are there any considerations for zoonotic disease risk and what are the policies governing wild meat consumption in Japan? Okay, thank you for the question. So in the past, in the past, the accident regarding the infection disease when eating wild meat sometimes happens. So most cases of such accidents were caused by eating raw meat or no, no cooked meat of deer or bear. So Japan's government has now developed a guideline regarding the use of game meat. Uh, this guideline shows a detail of how to slaughter and cook them for sanitary control and for decreasing the infection disease risks. And this guideline is very strict and every meat seller and every restaurant dealing with a game meat must follow this guideline. So now we have attained the sanitary control for the use of game meat, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think, oh, that would be the last of our questions. Uh, oh. Thank you, Inari-san. Over to you, John. Okay, thank you, Inari. Uh, thank with you that, well. I'd like to thank Professor Inari again for your very generous sharing. And also a big thank you to our audience on Zoom for joining us today. So, but before you leave, a uh, reminder to keep a lookout for the next session of our Wildlife Management Webinar Series, International Edition, which is next month. Okay, this will feature Professor Agustin Fuentes from Princeton University, who will be sharing with us an anthropological view on the complex nature of human macaque interactions around the world. So with that, thanks to all for attending this session and have a great day ahead. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.